among the many uh, statements or uh, endorsements of thermodynamics, there are the top two or three, one of them is by Albert Einstein. And it reads, classical thermodynamics is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. Now, considering in particular the, the um, enclosed clause, um, what this says in other words is that thermodynamics is correct when it's correct and it isn't when it isn't. So this begs the question, are there circumstances under which thermodynamics is not correct or not complete? So with this in mind, I would like to introduce this talk beyond the thermodynamic limit, a template for second law exceptions. And um, I'm at the University of San Diego, not UCSD. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge a number of people who made this possible, Charles Chase, of course, and Garrett Medell. And I'd also like to thank very much David Miller, my colleague here at the university, who's been doing some wonderful experiments, that um, some of which will be alluded to today. I'd also like to thank the Laney and Pasha Thornton Foundation for their generous support of this research. The outline of this talk is uh, fairly straightforward. It, you can consider it in a way a primer for the rest of the talks um, today concerning the second law. The first thing I'd like to do is talk about the thermodynamic limit, which is a technical term for an approximation that's often used in thermodynamics in order to get to results, and then talk about how important boundaries are to real systems. Next, I'd like to talk about the second law renaissance that's occurred over the last 25 to 30 years, which might also be called a second law revolution. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about one particular um, exception that's been found called epicatalysis, which has been studied in laboratories here at this university here at the University of San Diego for the last 25 years or so. And finally, um, from it, infer a template for second law exceptions, which appear to apply to all of them that are being discussed today and most um, in the literature. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to discuss ramifications and future, future directions, what this research could mean. Now to begin, let's just kind of give a general definition of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, you can say, has two words in it, thermo and dynamic, and, and that basically explains it. It's the science of the interplay between heat and work. And heat is microscopic motion, so to speak, and work is macroscopic motion. So the thermodynamic limit, however, is um, something more particular. And this is an approximation that's used uh, throughout the literature. And it's basically this, uh, consider a box uh, with N particles. This can be arbitrary, it's usually a very, very large number and a volume V given by um, this constant here. And let the number of particles go to infinity and let the volume of the container go to infinity. So both quantities N and V go to infinity, but their ratio doesn't. The ratio remains finite. This is the number density. And <clears throat> this is a very useful and powerful um, assumption because what it allows you to do is um, make more easily calculations of things like specific heats and transport coefficients like diffusion, uh, latent heats, um, uh, all sorts of nice things. So it's a, a standard approximation, but it also brings in a kind of mindset into thermodynamics, which is that boundaries are ignorable. You can let the system just become infinite in size and forget about what the boundaries are doing. And this is a dangerous assumption. For as Mark Twain said, what gets you into trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. And it turns out, that boundaries are not ignorable when it comes to lots of thermodynamics. So boundaries are what we interact with on an everyday basis. When we touch things, we're talking about boundaries. When, uh, when water falls over a waterfall, it, it, it touches the rocks surfaces, not the inside of the rocks. Boundaries are where the action really is in most of life. And in fact, many, if not most, of all the fields of physics are largely defined by their boundaries. So for instance, if you consider a plasma, <clears throat> a plasma has a sheath at, the, at, its, at its edge called the, uh, the Debye sheath. And in that sheath, the plasma 
has very non-equilibrium characteristics to it. It has a potential drop across it. It has uh, distribution functions um, for velocity, which are uh, nonlinear, non-Maxwellian. And these very strongly affect um, how the plasma interacts with the outside world. If we look at semiconductors, the semiconductor devices like the PN diode, which is kind of the starting point for uh, our modern technology in electronics, it consists of P-type and N-type silicon, for instance, which are differentially doped um, uh, silicon, and they come together at a junction. And that junction really matters for, for making diodes and transistors. And in this region called the depletion region, where the P and N meet, where the boundary of them is, you have built-in potential, you have um, um, drop-offs in density, you have strong electric fields, lots and lots is happening here. In chemistry, almost everything in the room that you touch today will have been, ta will have been touched by heterogeneous catalysis somewhere along its path in the production of the chemicals. And, under, and, a, and a catalyst can, is, is a, a surface which interacts with molecules to create new products. Again, it's the boundary. In biology, which will be discussed later today by James Lee, um, every, every cell and many of its organelles have boundaries to them, the membranes. And these are very complex devices that uh, assure, that make possible life. Each one of these, in fact, each one of these four has been invoked in research at the University of San Diego and uh, among the roughly one dozen or so second law challenges that we've put forward over the last 25 to 30 years. As has been said, God made the bulk, the devil made the surface and the boundaries. Boundaries, well, just by their mere existence, they indicate some sort of broken physical or chemical symmetry in the system. They are discontinuities in chemical potential, pressure, or temperature. And because they're discontinuities in things like chemical potentials, they're automatically reservoirs of free energy. And they also, in effect, represent a metastable state because true equilibrium would be a complete smearing out of all particles to uniform density and temperature. And whenever you have a boundary, that simply is not the case. So if you wait long enough, any boundary will erase and disappear. So it never really was an equilibrium state. They're metastable states. Now, if you have thermodynamic properties um, on a boundary, they're usually more complex than the bulk. And they also present opportunities for work extraction. And some of these surfaces, some of these boundaries actually some allow for cyclic work extraction derived from ambient single temperature thermal energy. And that mouthful basically means you can challenge or possibly violate the second law. Now, <clears throat> to put this into perspective, the second law has been um, undergoing really unprecedented scrutiny over the last 25 to 30 years. Uh, roughly three to four dozen, closer to four dozen second law challenges have, have reached into the scientific literature since the 1990s. 60 to 80 articles are in the refereed scientific literature. And there are more of these in the last 25 years than there have been in the last 170 years of the history of the second law. It's been a revolution, it's a renaissance. There's been a technical monograph published by Springer on the subject and international conferences held for the first time. And so things are changing, not maybe quickly enough for those of us in the field, but nonetheless, they're changing. And you can see it in the progression of the second law challenges that have arisen over the last 25 years or so. What I would call generation one would be the first 15 years or so. And most of the challenges at that point were theoretical in nature. They were uh, thought experiments. <clears throat> Mostly they were in extreme uh, physical regimes like very high temperatures or very low temperatures, purely quantum systems large gravitating objects, things like that. And there were only a handful, a few corroborating experiments of the basic, um, basic physical processes. Generation two from 2005, 2015, there was uh, more theory, but stronger experimental support, stronger corroboratory evidence that something might be amiss, and even a few patents. <clears throat> Generation three, which is what we're in right now and which will be discussed more fully during, uh, during today, 
has uh, more diversity, uh, more room temperature and pressure, more uh, everyday accessible types of second law challenges. And many, I shouldn't say many, several confirmation experiments. What I'm looking forward to is generation four, which would be the second law challenges or second law devices, which are commercialized. And this may be perhaps in the next several years. <clears throat> so when it comes to generation three, uh, these are um, experiments or ideas that in principle or have been experimentally tested. Um, later today, uh, Paul Thibodeau will be talking about his graphene trampoline and, um, and extractions of, of current from that. Thermionic emitters from Germano de, Bra uh, de Bramo. Um, some similar work of this in plasma systems was done at the university here back in the 1990s. Uh, cell membranes by James Lee. Uh, the Casimir cavity hot electron system by Garrett. Um, this one is it's not confirmed that it's a second law device. Uh, some of us think so. Garrett is, uh, is weighing um, multiple possibilities very open-mindedly. And um, at the university here, we've looked at roughly a dozen over the last 25 years and um, falling into multiple categories um, listed here. We'll be taking a look at the last one, which is probably the most broad of, of that group. So let's talk a little bit about the second law. Um, we understand the second law in really a kind of an intuitive, in an intuitive way. We feel it in our bones. We feel it in almost everything we do. The second law has been called the supreme law of nature uh, by uh, Arthur Eddington um, 90 years ago because it applies to almost everything. Um, and we, we see it in the fact that cars need gas, houses need heating and cooling. Appliances need electricity, industry needs power, we need food, and we have to constantly resupply things. Everything needs an energy supply because otherwise it simply runs down. And this has become, is because work gets transformed into heat. Things get messier. At the microscopic level, you can see this as the transition of order into disorder. Organized energy, which you'd call work, um, is in the form of electrical, um, power coming out of the wall, kinetic energy of things like cars, gravitational potential energy of water in a, in a dam, chemical energy, which keeps us alive and runs our cars, nuclear energy. And all of this organized energy gets ultimately or largely transformed into disorganized energy, thermal energy, heat, microscopic motion from the second law. You can see this as a transition from low entropy to high entropy states, from high quality energy degraded into low quality energy. And this occurs, and the second law can be seen from the smallest processes in nature at, at nuclear levels, all the way up to the ultimate fate of the cosmos. So indeed, it's a wide ranging law. Now, the second law itself does not have a single statement. There are lots of different forms of it. In the book that Vlada Kepak and I wrote back in 2005, we accumulated 21 different versions of the second law we found in the, in the literature. And among them, the, the, probably the most prominent are, are these. The first, the kelvin planck form of the second law, heat cannot be transformed solely into work in a thermodynamic cycle. That means that you can't reorganize the disorder in, at the microscopic level into macroscopic order again without paying a price. And um, this is in a sense, the gold standard, it goes back to the age of the steam engine, 1850. The one by Max Planck is probably the second most famous entropy or disorder, never decreases for any spontaneous natural process. And then the Clausius form, which also goes back 150 years, um, heat goes from hot to cold, not vice versa. And this is what you see, hot objects cool down, cold objects don't spontaneously heat up. Perpetual motion machines are impossible. There are no perfect heat engines, refrigerators, or anything else. All natural processes are irreversible. And these statements can be you know, summarized in some informal ones, like Murphy's Law. Um, if anything can go wrong, it will, and its corollaries. Things like situations tend to progress from bad to worse. The only way to deal with a can of worms is to find a bigger can. And then there's the existential form of the second law. We're all going to die. And this is largely mediated by the second law. On the other hand, the fact that time goes forward, the fact that things happen, 
is due to the second law. The irreversibility of the universe gives us its charm and gives life its taste. So although it'll kill us in the end, the second law is really the means by which time goes forward and things happen. So it's a wonderful law. But what is the nature of physical law? I think people have a, um, can often have a mis, uh, misunderstanding of what, of what physical laws are. Many scientists actually believe the second law can be proven. And that's not true. From a purely epistemological point of view, you can't prove a physical law. It's an axiom of science. And axioms, by their very na nature, cannot be proved. If you could prove the second law from more fundamental ideas, those would be the laws. Because if you prove something, it's a theorem. So the second law cannot be proven. It's simply believed because it's observed to be true. But that also means that it's provisional. It's true, only, absolutely true, only because it is observed to be absolutely true. And a single exception to that would not destroy its usefulness per se, but simply destroy its inviolability and open up possibilities. Most laws that we have that you look at in the literature are in fact rules of thumb. They are not absolute, although they are quite useful. The ideal gas law, for instance. Well, it sounds like it's ideal and it sounds like a law, but in fact, it assumes point-like particles that are non-interacting, and that's not true of real gases. So you might want to uh, do something like the van der Waals equation instead, which updates it a bit, but still is not exact. So there are, there are creating a perfectly true gas law is probably almost impossible. Universals, uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation. Well, it's really good for everyday gravitational dynamics and good enough for NASA for the most part. But we know that the general theory of relativity by Einstein himself supersedes Newton's universal law of gravitation and is a more exact description of nature. Moreover, uh, the general theory of relativity is thought to be an approximation itself. There might be something more underlying it, for instance, quantum gravity. Hubble's law, of, um, which describes the distance velocity relationship for distant galaxies, uh, is not true for distances less than maybe 50 to 100 uh, million light years. And furthermore, when you, when you throw in something like uh, dark energy, it's not really true. So Hubble's law is, again, again, just a rule of thumb. The law of natural selection, another example. Most so-called laws have limits of applicability. And so it's quite reasonable to assume that the second law does as well. After all, it was discovered 170 years ago in the age of steam engines. And since then, we've had all sorts of new kinds of energy discovered. We've had special relativity, quantum mechanics, chaos theory, and, and other revolutions as well. So there's no reason to expect the second law to be absolute, although it is terribly useful. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, the concept of epicatalysis, which is an area, uh, which is a form of catalysis, so to speak, that challenges the second law. So let's kind of review, first of all, what catalysts do. Catalysts are usually are, are assumed to have three properties. First is that they speed up chemical reactions. Next, they're not consumed by the reaction that they speed up. And third, they don't change the final equilibrium of the reaction that they enter into. So let's consider a simple reaction where we have a diatomic molecule, A2, in, in equilibrium with its monomers. So the diatomic A2 disassociates into two monomers, 2A, and those can recombine back into A2. And in a closed system with, uh, with walls and gas phase equilibrium, you, would, you have a particular gas phase equilibrium. But when you get into a situation where the mean free path of your gas is long compared to the size of the cavity, and that you have chemical reactivity of that gas with the walls, then the third principle of catalysis, which says that the equilibrium is unique, is not true anymore. For instance, if we consider two surfaces, S2 and S1, these are two different surfaces. Let's say this is um, <clears throat> made out of rhenium and the S1 is made out of tungsten. And let's say we have hydrogen um, uh, molecules and atoms. If two atoms come in, they can recombine to form 
a, uh, the diatomic species. And if the diatomic species comes in, it can just sit around and then just leave as the diatomic species again. So you have recombination occurring preferentially on S2. S1, on the other hand, can have a reaction with the surface such that the monomers come in and leave without much, um, without much trouble, but the diatomic molecule comes in and is split and disassociates into two A atoms. This phenomena has been noted for well over 100 years with hydrogen. Hydrogen reacting with high temperature refractory metals like tungsten, rhenium, molybdenum, uh, tantalum, and, and iridium are, have been known to disassociate hydrogen at, um, at different rates. But no one ever really thought to think what that really means. What it means is this. If one surface is preferentially recombining um, monomers into dimers, the bond energy is liberated into the surface and it begins to heat. Conversely, if you have a surface which preferentially disassociates molecules into atoms, it has to provide the, um, the bond ener the, um, energy um, to break that bond. And as a result, it will cool. So under these circumstances, you can imagine the following scenario. Two surfaces, surface two and surface one inside a cavity such that the mean free path is long and the molecules interact with the surfaces and don't interact with each other in the gas phase such that they simply go from surface to surface for the most, most part. On surface one, you have disassociation. On surface two, you have recombination. As a result, S2 heats, S1 cools, and now you have a temperature difference. That temperature difference then can be used to drive a classical heat engine where heat from the high temperature reservoir Goes through, the goes through the heat engine, creates work, performs work, and excess uh, heat goes back to the cold reservoir. And this can continue in principle indefinitely because this temperature differential is, quote, originally an equilibrium state of the system. This is what's called an epicatalytic thermal diode. In real, in real life, you might be able to exploit this temperature differential by putting in a thermoelectric generator between the two surfaces and export the electricity. Now, the idea of epicatalysis was controversial since it was first put forward because it was understood that it could lead to a, a, a second law of violation. Experiments have been conducted now which verify the existence of epicatalysis. The theory surrounding epicatalysis can be found in a number of papers in Physical Review and, and elsewhere. And experiments were performed back in 2013 and 2014, which uh, verified or strongly, I would say verify, but others might say corroborate this phenomenon. And the way it works is this. The experiments are conducted in uh, a high vacuum, a vacuum vessel. And inside of it, one, one puts um, a black body cylinder. Now a black body is just a closed container that has one temperature in it. And the temperature of this black body cylinder can be changed by passing current through, this, through the metallic walls. And that can heat it up ohmically like a, a heat, like a filament in a light bulb. Inside of it, and going now to the, the far right diagram, this is the inside of the cavity. Current passes through the walls. The walls are made out of either tungsten or rhenium, both work. And inside you have two filaments. These are actually thermocouples, one coated with rhenium, one coated with tungsten. The experiments which describe this um, are in foundations of physics. Now, when the walls, the walls temperature can be varied from room temperature up to about 2000 Kelvin. And um, when you heat up the walls at, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good vacuum or high vacuum, you find that the two thermocouples register the same temperature as you would expect. They're inside the same container and therefore they should come to the same temperature. So in a vacuum, they come to the same temperature. Now, when you put in helium, which is a, um, an inert noble gas, again, they come exactly to the same temperatures, which is what you'd expect. But then if you put in hydrogen at the same pressures you would put in the helium, the temperatures of these diverge greatly up to over 125 degrees Kelvin difference at pressures on the order of a few torr. And the reason is 
rhenium breaks down, rhenium um, uh, recombines hydrogen better than tungsten does. And as a result, it cools, the tungsten heats. And the power per unit area difference in terms of, um, uh, in terms of power between these is on the order of a tenth of a megawatt per square meter. These devices, of course, are quite small. And so the, the power differences between the two are got not very much, but in terms of surface area, it is quite substantial. This is repeatable. The temperature difference remains until the hydrogen is, is taken out. Um, and this demonstrates that in a single black body cavity, you can achieve two separate temperatures. This would be like in your own room right now, having a block of ice and a hot cup of coffee, coffee staying hot forever and the ice never melting. That's second law simply does not allow for that, but this experiment demonstrates it. Now, because this experiment was conducted at very low pressures and at very high temperatures, no one has repeated it. And since, it's a, since these original experiments, our laboratory has been looking for evidence of not high temperature epicatalysis, but room temperature epicatalysis. And some early experiments back in 2015 suggested very strongly that, that hydrogen bonded dimers like formic acid could create room temperature epicatalysis. And so as kind of an update, or I should say a postscript, we have done those experiments now looking for temperature differentials. And these experiments were, were conducted by my colleague, uh, David Miller. He's done a wonderful job. Um, and in the last two weeks, we have found very, very strong evidence for room temperature epicatalysis with sizable temperature differentials between polymer surfaces interacting with formic acid. The power densities poten potentially available in epicatalytic thermal diodes have been um, calculated analytically and through numerical simulation found to be substantial. In principle, the power densities could be as high as 100 megawatts per cubic meter, but of course that cannot be attained because if you're going to get power from an ETD that requires turning heat into work and you have to supply the ETD with thermal energy and that's gonna be limited by how fast you can, you can send that energy in. And so this kind of power density will not be attainable except for brief moments before the system freezes itself to death. But its uses, well, the power, the, the power that you get out of an ETD could be used for basically any form of work that you would normally want to use it for, heating and cooling directly, thermal electricity, freezing or boiling water. So the ETD is a, is a um, instantiation of a second law, not just challenge, but violator. And it suggests, by example, conditions for second law exceptions. And I would like to, to pose or propose the following. The, the conditions for a second law exception would probably involve these five characteristics. First of all, some sort of finite or bounded system. In other words, one that does not adhere to the mindset, at least, of the thermodynamic limit. In other words, taking boundaries seriously. Number two, there should be a thermally regenerable energy reservoir. That's something you could express as KT, Boltzmann's constant times temperature, at, at one or more of the boundaries. Next, you need to have a, a physical or thermodynamic asymmetry built into the system. You need an independent, so to speak, orthogonal work extraction apparatus that's independent of the, of the um, energy reservoir. And fifth, you need to have a, some sort of um, some sort of switchable or resettable metastable configuration for your system. Another, another way, in other words, a way to reset the thermal reservoir of, um, of, of the uh, device. So let's look at these in terms of the um, ETD, the epicatalytic thermal diode. It's certainly a finite and bounded system, check. The thermally regenerable energy reservoir at the boundary is is found in the two molecules, or the, um, the monomer A and the dimer A2. These, uh, the bond energy and breaking um, and recombining it is the source of your energy reservoir at the boundary. The physical thermodynamic uh, asymmetry that's built into this particular system are S1 and S2. These two surfaces have different chemical activities with respect to A and A2. The independent work extraction apparatus, well, it could be the thermoelectric uh, system that we talked about earlier. Switchable and resettable 
um, um, aspect of it comes about because of the gas cycling between the two surfaces and the walls. So all of these, these five uh, characteristics are met by the ETD. And it turns out they are met by all of the dozen or so uh, uh, second law uh, challenges that have been promoted at the University of San Diego. And furthermore, I would argue that they are these five characteristics can be seen in each of the generation three second law exceptions that are being that can um, that are being described by um, the uh, other presenters today. So I, I um, kind of ask or maybe challenge you to try to look for how these fit in. <clears throat> so what does this mean? What what a, a second law device does if it's if it violates the second law in a in a, in a way that that uh, um, extracts work, so to speak, from, from the heat bath. You can call it a heat recycler. So, uh, so if you take a, a typical system, like a car or a TV, a heater, a computer, lights, whatever you wish, it generates a lot of waste heat. All the energy you've paid for in your life, 99% of it is turned into heat, probably more. And after that, you can't use it again. But a heat recycler takes that heat and turns it back into work. So if you form this cycle between the system and the heat recycler, you basically turned heat not into a sustainable form of energy and not into a, just a green form of energy or a renewable form of energy. You have turned it into a recyclable form of energy. It's a, a completely different mindset when it comes to energy. Your system creates heat, your heat recycler creates work, and they work together such that you have a closed system. So you don't need to get energy, <clears throat> energy from elsewhere, because it's all around us. <clears throat> so to give you an idea of how much thermal energy or heat is around us on an everyday basis, consider a cubic meter of air. And your, the room you're in may have several hundred cubic meters. Each cubic meter of air, in terms of just the kinetic energy of the molecules, oxygen and nitrogen, corresponds to roughly the chemical energy of detonating 60 grams of, of TNT. A cubic meter of water, if you were to take it from 20 degrees C down to zero degrees C and form ice, the amount of energy that, could, that you could extract from that cubic meter of water would be equivalent to about 100 kilograms of TNT, over 200 pounds of TNT. So literally, we are living in an environment just with thermal energy alone. We're just swimming in energy. And because of the second law up till now, we can't get at it. But if we could, with heat recyclers, if you were to take the atmosphere, ocean, and upper crust and consider simply the amount of thermal energy available there, it would be roughly 10,000 times the, the fossil fuel, the, the chemical energy of all the fossil fuel reserves in the world. And if in fact, heat is truly recyclable, then because you can constantly recyclable, recycle it and use it again and again, the energy supplies are virtually infinite, effectively. So what are the ramifications of, of, of such devices? Well, certainly energy would, would change its character from being one from work being simply being lost in the form of heat to making energy recyclable. Um, heat itself is ubiquitous, it's free, it's clean, it's green and effectively inexhaustible. Energy itself though, represents 10% of the world's economy. And if you were to, and if you were to suddenly, so to speak, change that, uh, energy equation, that energy um, ecology that we have in our economy, lots of things would change. You would have economic disruptions, you would have industrial changes in, in a massive scale. You would probably have geopolitical upheaval as well. But you'd also have lots of ecological benefits. This form of energy does not produce CO2 or other greenhouse gases except in the production of the devices themselves. Uh, you don't have to tear up the land to get to the coal or drill holes in the ground. You won't have oil spills. There'd be all sorts of ecological benefits for it. Literally, energy makes the world go round in every sense of the word, in the sense physically, chemically, thermodynamically, ecologically, um, economically, geopolitically, militarily. Energy is the currency of change. And if you change the fundamental relationship of ourselves to energy, you change all of those things. I think it would be actually quite useful now, before things truly get underway, to consider what the world would be like if energy were truly democratized. 
if energy no longer cost anything aside from the devices that were to extract it directly from the environment? How would that change the, um, things like the use of the power grid, the, the, um, um, the ecology and economy of the world? All of these things would, would change. But I, to my knowledge, this has never really been considered in a serious manner. I think a, a good time to do that would be now. Because as generation three goes to generation four devices, from the experiment, from the lab, to the commercial realm, um, things will change. And this will typically, if one looks at history, take 30 to 40 years. Once, um, once commercial devices are created, that's how long new technologies typically take. But it could be on an accelerated um, time scale if, um, if uh, given the emergency in the environment. So in summary, um, the second law, if one looks hard at it straight ahead, there are experiments now which uh, violate certain, certain versions of the second law. You know, um, and can be taken therefore as violating the second law, and that all of them involve some sort of boundary-free energy source. This seems to be a key um, aspect of it. There are half a dozen sec such second law experiments currently in progress around the world, and um, I believe generation four devices are on the horizon. I'd like to end this talk with a couple of things. The first is what is considered probably to be the most famous of all second law endorsements, by Arthur Eddington, who was a scientist um, who was really as famous as Einstein in the early 20th century. And uh, over 90 years ago, he, um, he said what is often used as the, um, as the main justification for considering the second law absolute. The law that entropy always increases, the second law of thermodynamics holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equation, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equation. If it is found to be contradicted by observation, well, these experimentalists bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. I think the time has passed for um, such fundamentalist statements of faith concerning the second law. And I think it's time to consider new formulations of the second law. For instance, one something like this. For any spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe never decreases, except when it does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a fantastic introduction uh, to the field, to uh, this symposium, and uh, to your results. Uh, one of the fascinating things for me has been how Daniel has been publishing evidence uh, for violation for uh, years, and that evidence has been met in the scientific literature with silence. And uh, maybe today is a, is a will be will mark a little bit of a change there. Um, George, uh, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Professor Sheehan, I think this is probably one of the most important uh, presentations in this symposium or uh, many others. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, I have only uh, two questions, try to keep it uh, short amongst uh, many others. Uh, one is sort of a metaphysical and the other is uh, more practical. The metaphysical question is, uh, you had mentioned that um, time goes forward because of the second law. Um, uh, this may be a take a long answer, but have you uh, written anything on that uh, issue uh, apart from um, uh, pure physical uh, article or physics articles? And my second question is, um, given that, uh, um, that the surrounding heat bath can supply uh, the necessary energy, you might say, um, given uh, the uh, epicatalysis uh, and the, the thermal diode idea, uh, have you determined whether there's a minimum usable temperature for an ambient heat bath that would enable us to power uh, the kinds of uh, uh, meso and macro scale energy, uh, energy consumers uh, that, that we currently have, like uh, heat for a house or uh, energy for a car. 
Sure. Thank you. Okay, um, you asked the questions which would take a day to answer, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a brief one. In terms of the um, arrow of time, there are multiple arrows of time that have been proposed. For everyday life, the second law is considered to be um, what's called the thermodynamic arrow, pushing things forward. I've written a little bit about it. I'd be happy to send something along if you're interested. I think your second question, um, I think is maybe more pertinent right now, which is um, uh, what kind of, how big of a device would be needed to actually uh, you know, power a house well, um, if you have room temperature epicatalysis, um, the power densities are still re really quite large. So if you were to have something roughly the size of a large coffee can and, um, and you pull th um, air through it at a few meters a second, and as the air goes through, it cools maybe 10 degrees C. So it comes in at 20, it leaves at 10, then that would be able to produce, produce based on, on the um, numbers we have of a couple kilowatts easily enough to power a house. So you could basically power a house with uh, maybe a panel the size of a, a large picture on, on one side of your room, which would draw heat from your environment and power everything in your house. But of course your house is gonna be creating, uh, expelling heat from your computer, your refrigerator and everything else, which just keeps the cycle going. So you can have a closed system with, uh, with fairly small uh, epic epicatalytic devices. Uh, Justin Coven. Uh, you're on mute. My area is in artificial intelligence and computer science, uh, computation, reasoning about reasoning, uh, how you develop reasoning systems. I like really like the way that you started your presentation when you're talking about every law is an axiom. And, and from a computational perspective, every model of science, every type of reasoning is, is nothing more than a tool, a tool to say that some some law is true or something or other is is as good as saying a wrench is true. And it's, it, there's lots of different types of wrenches you use for different purposes. Sure. Um, so that was great. Uh, there's another, and I have a presentations online, uh, Meta Level Science uh, YouTube. Um, but the, you know, the next step is you start getting a list of different types of, okay, well, here's an example of entropy in this very sub, you know, one subspace. But you can also look at structure being created all over the place. There's lots of different places where you see structure being created, mm -hmm. um, as, whether it's life, artificial life, cosmological, it, the structures being created. You can create just a, as, as long a list for structure being created. Um, and it would be nice to see that type of uh, list also. Uh, third, perpetual. Um, all energy that we use in the real world is perpetual, whether we're taking from the sun, or we're taking for geothermal, uh, water, uh, whether you're even actually burning fuels, that those chemical reactions from an energetic formula perspective, equation perspective, each one of them is perpetual because you're always getting this chain of one after the other. It's just supplying the fuel, which is not part of the energy equation. Same with nuclear. So to say that you know, there's no such thing as perpetual energy. Every, all the energy we use is perpetual. We're taking it from the environment. Mm -hmm. um, fourth, and I'm not just going over points, I'm, I'm trying to, to get to something, to a question. Um, in, in some sense, you could say that the second law, since there's been so many different iterations of it, it, it can't really be a law because there's, these are just all just general concepts. But it's, as you mentioned, it's a closed system. But what the second law is basically saying at the, at the crux of it is it's, you can't have one energy system that doesn't have some siphoning off into another. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, the second law is basically itself saying that um, energy is, um, there's no such thing as a closed energy system. But the second law itself says you are in a closed system because it's transforming to another system. Okay, it's transforming one thing to another. So there's a, a logical inconsistency, but every computation as a computational science, that's what you have. You always have singularities, paradoxes, et cetera, in computational systems. There's, you can't get away from it. Uh, the more complex system, the more involved it is. You have those things that happen. So in some sense, you, you, the second law says, well, in a closed system, but then you really don't can never have a closed system because energy transfers into another. So, you know, I'm sitting here looking at computation. I'm sort of asking, why is everybody talking about this stuff? You know, well, you can't have perpetual, but it's all perpetual. And, you know, you have this law, but it's just a tool. Why, why are we so focused on these archaic concepts that came from 100 years ago? Okay. 
and and don't relate to <laughs> okay. real competition that's happening in the world now. Yeah, I, so Justin, you've you've touched on all the major ideas in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, and that would take a book to to actually discuss. So I'm going to try to kind of cut through and just talk, um, kind of respond to a couple of your points. Would it be okay? I can't respond to everything. Um, in, in terms of the idea that, that all energy is perpetual, well, energy is conserved. Mass energy is conserved in, in reactions, at least at our level. And um, so when you say it's perpetual, fine. I mean, you can have work being degraded down into heat and, and now the, the macroscopic energy becomes microscopic um, energy and you say, well, that's perpetual. Well, um, I, I guess the, the way thermodynamics handles it is, is that it has to do with the quality of the energy. Um, and once it gets down to the to the molecular level, it's it, it can't can't be used easily again to for for work. So I, I guess I would take exception with the idea that it's perpetual, although I think you're really pointing to the idea of conservation of energy, which is the first law. Um, as for creating structure, um, yes, the world creates structure, but it creates it because of the non-equilibrium nature of the world. If you drive a system. Uh, you can get structure out of it. So if you drive the earth with an entropy gradient from the sun to the earth, you create the biosphere. But um, so it, it, this does not violate the second law to create structure um, because in the process, of, uh, the process of creating structure, you end up creating more entropy. So the second law is a tax it, on, on any kind of natural phenomena. It doesn't destroy or create energy. It simply says that the quality of that energy has to be changed in the process, that you lose a little bit of its usefulness along the way. So I agree with, with the spirit of some of the things you say, although I think from a thermodynamic perspective, I have to disagree. Can I just one follow-up to clarify what my point was? Yes. Um, so when I say perpetual, it means that all of that energy is coming from the environment, Yes. That whether it's solar, what have you whether it's stored in, in a chemical or, or in the environment, what have you, you're taking it out. You're always taking some energy from the environment. So all of the energy we have is perpetually being taken from the environment. Okay. Yeah, I and agree the, with you. I and then you. second, when you have that loss of energy, it's going back into the environment somehow. You know, sure. we have conservation, it's, it, it's right. going to be right. there. So yeah. it's coming from, and the second one will say, well, it's going to, you know, it can't all be used in one way. Some yep. of it's going to go off into the environment. Right. Again, perpetual. Everything's right perpetually. But, but the, the perpetual nature, I think you're referring to, has to do with this conservation rather than its ability to actually carry out more useful work. So I think that's the difference. That's a difference in what we're the way we're discussing it. Um, we're already at the top of the hour. Um, Robert Solomon has a question. If you can make that question. 30 seconds or less, and then also have a very quick answer. Sure. Please. Okay, of course, I'll be speaking so fast, you barely be able to understand, so you'll have to play it back at slow speed. Okay, <laughs> basically, matter persists forever. Matter is not supposedly created or destroyed except for e equals mc squared. But let's get back to the most basic thing. Stop calling it energy. We're talking about photons. And when we're talking about photons, we're talking about accelerated charge. And that is what we're talking about. And if we can get back to what it really is, instead of using these words like energy and so on, and we envision a universe filled with photons or connections between various charges due to their acceleration mediated by what we call a photon, I think we'd be able to make a lot more progress. Daniel? That might be an enlightened approach. I don't know. I can't really comment on that. <laughs>